Welcome to the Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. You have this plant, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, people have been dedicating their life to make something amazing out of it. It is living art and you can't appreciate it until you consume it. It's a lot more than just grape juice. It's a drug, really. How much do you know about wine? No one does mania like wine lovers. I mean, we all know this. If you've ever sat next to someone at a dinner party who loves wine, they won't stop telling you about how much they love wine. How much do you want to know? So there's this diploma called the Master Sommelier Diploma. It's the highest achievement you can make in the world of wine. The clips you're hearing are from a 2013 film called Som, a documentary about a group of wine professionals trying to become master sommeliers, royalty in the wine world. I've got to know every single wine on the planet. It's pretty amazing the amount of information you have to know. The regions, the subregions, the districts, the villages, it's in five languages. Why certain years were good, how to serve it, what to eat with every different kind of wine. A very small number of people have ever actually achieved the Master Sommelier title. I believe there's more people that have gone to space. 536 people have traveled in space. Just 249 people have qualified as Master Sommeliers. To become a member of this exclusive club requires passing what's been described as the hardest test in the world that you've never heard of. The final test consists first of a theory exam, basically any question about any alcoholic beverage plus cigars is fair game. And about 90% of people who take that exam fail it. Once you've passed that exam, you're eligible to take a service exam, which is how gracefully can you deal with a situation that has gone completely off the rails. And you have a blind tasting section of the exam. So you arrive into a room, you are presented with six pre-poured glasses of wine, and you have to identify what those are, down to some tiny little corner of vineyard somewhere in France. It's extremely hard. This is a pursuit for the obsessed. It takes years of effort, costs thousands to buy practice wines, and can take over people's lives. The writer, Bianca Bosker, wanted to find out why. I didn't understand what was the big deal about wine. Why would people spend all of this time and money and energy on this thing that at the end of the day turns into expensive pee? I think I can say that on the radio, right? This is The Why Factor on the BBC World Service. I'm Sandra Canthal. And this week, why are we so fascinated by wine? It's been called the nectar of the gods and tempted connoisseurs for centuries. It's been associated with truth, hence the Latin expression in vino veritas. It's been the focus of religious allegory, turning water into wine. It can be a status symbol. The most expensive bottle of wine ever sold was auctioned off in October for over half a million dollars. Or it might lead us down the path of temptation and perhaps embarrassment. Bianca Bosker found the world of wine so absorbing, she left her job as a technology writer to see if she could take up residency among that subculture of the wine world, those elite sommeliers. Encountering this world of cork dorks, which is the industry's nickname for the most passionate and obsessive wine lovers among them, made me realize just how sterile my life was. These were people who had taken wine, which I'd always thought of as a thing of pleasure, something you turn to after a long, stressful day, and turned it into something approaching sheer god-awful pain. They licked rocks to train their palates. They divorced their spouses to spend more time reviewing flashcards. They had hired voice coaches and memory coaches. They took dance classes to learn how to move more gracefully across the dining room floor. She wrote a book about her time in this world called Cork Dork. 
in my new life as an aspiring sommelier, I would say most weekday mornings around 9 a.m., I was sitting down to my first 6 to 12 glasses of wine. I would be desperately drunk by noon, very hungover by 2 p.m., craving some sort of greasy burger by 4. And this was my life. Bianca did spend time working as a sommelier, though she's not employed as one now. The film Somme went on to have two sequels, plus there are enough television programmes and YouTube clips to keep people watching wine professionals for hours on end. And it does seem like a job with many attractions. So we're going downstairs to see the cellar. There's about 500 different wines. Xavier Rousser is taking me to an elegant tasting room in the basement of his London wine bar. One side you get the white, the fine wines and champagne in the temperature control room, and then the other side is the red. Low ceilings, lots of wood panelling and wine everywhere. Hundreds of tempting bottles neatly stacked along every wall and more in additional rooms behind glass walls. In the morning to the evening, we just leave wine, we breathe wine, we talk wine, that's what we do. I get to know most of those wines, yeah. Xavier is a master sommelier, but more than that, he has a particular distinction. Particular distinction as in being the youngest in the world, yes, at the age of 23. But mind you, I've been studying when I was 18, so it was five years of pretty much every day studying, reading, tasting, traveling to wineries. It's, it's a big commitment. Back then, I was tasting, I don't know, 3,000 wine a year, I think. But if you break it down, if you work with wine every day, it's only 10 bottles a day. Tasting, not drinking, obviously. And how many years did you do this? Five years, yeah, before I passed the exam. Maybe I taste a bit less now, but still one and a half to 2,000 wine a year. And do you worry about your liver at all? Yeah, sometimes, but it's tasting, not drinking. So even though you sip a little bit, you have to be quite careful, obviously, yeah. After years of working in restaurants around Europe, Xavier now has five establishments of his own, and wine plays a huge part in them. Sometimes 50% of the revenue of a restaurant is wet lead, as we say, it's the drinks. So it's quite important to have someone in charge to make sure the service is right, how many bottles you have, and the stock taking, and so on and so forth. And the role of a sommelier has changed quite a bit in the last 10 or 15 years. To make the wine less intimidating is the approach you have to with the customer, really. But there's one characteristic of the role that's been more resistant to change. Of the 249 master sommeliers in the world, more than 200 are men. The number of women is around 30. Which begs the question, why is this such a man's world? Why? That's another good question. Maybe wine was drunk by male, you know, guys usually, and it has to be more guys serving the guys. It's all very old-fashioned. Do people react differently when they see a male and a female sommelier? We should ask my girl here, actually. So I did. I'm Daniela Shelton. I'm the sommelier here. But everyone calls me Danny. Danny's been working at the restaurant for eight months. She's not a master sommelier like Xavier, but she's been in the wine trade for ten years. Culturally, it has always been very male orientated. You look at the winemakers, there is more male winemakers than women. The people who are selling it, people who are recommending it, learning it, drinking it as well. It's changing, but I think it's a slow change. Do you ever get any customers who want to show off and try to show that they know more than you do? All the time, every day. There is always one. It's kind of fun. I want to find out what the knowledge of the customer is, how geeky do I get, and then I kind of adjust to it. And some people I just let tell me their story. It's fine, it's part of my job, but it happens all the time. <laughs> when I was on the dating scene, the fact that I knew about wine actually killed many dates. Emma Dawson is a master of wine, another incredibly demanding qualification in the wine world. The course is so rigorous, it took her seven years to complete. You know, in seven years I could have become a doctor, or more, you know. And she sorted out her romantic life by getting together with a man keen to learn more about what he drinks. Together, they write a blog called 52 Grapes to help others who find the world of wine somewhat intimidating. 
We thought about how complicated it is. And there is a lot to know, but I think, you know, our blog's actually trying to make it more approachable. And so we do that on our blog by tasting a different grape each week, and I give a kind of expert opinion. But also then my partner, he almost teases me sometimes about the language I use because he's taking it from most people's point of view, which is I'm struggling to describe this grape, but I actually like it. The average consumer doesn't need to be able to describe, you know, 20 different fruits and all these different strange kind of aromas, licking wet stones. You know, we all joke about doing that to try and describe what a wet stone is like when you're tasting wine. But for an average consumer, they're not really thinking that. No, they're really not. Why is the language of wine so confusing? I want to start with the caveat that this idea of tasting notes, of describing wine in terms of graphite and a little bit of charcoal and, you know, some fuzz du bois. I don't know what that is either. This is a relatively new tradition. It dates back about to the 70s. So tasting notes are really only about as old as disco. <laughs> One of the tasting notes that I most love to hate is one that described this Cabernet as tasting like a wine with no hard edges. But but nonetheless had a skyscraper-like texture and comes across like a flawlessly constructed dress from a haute couture house in Paris. What? What does that actually taste like? Well, I haven't tried it. I have no idea. So, I guess we'll pour a little... The wine you're hearing is being served in an academics office at Oxford University. Charles Spence is a professor of experimental psychology with an interest in how our senses affect our everyday experiences. His work focuses on food and drink. He also likes wine. Some of our current research is on what happens after you've opened the bottle and what can you infer from that sound. Can you tell if it's red or white wine? No. Can you hear the shape of the bottle? How does one hear the shape of a bottle? So here we've got a sort of a a Bordeaux bottle with uh, broad shoulders versus our New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc with much more sort of sloping shoulders instead. And as I pour and think about the glugs as the liquid comes out... There are some experts who say, you know, I'm sure I can tell the wine from the sound of pouring... Or at least I can tell the region, perhaps, or the shape of a bottle, and that might give me some clues as to what I'm tasting. And I think they're probably right that the time between glugs will probably differ by bottle shape. So that information, again, is being picked up, probably subconsciously, but it's probably there in the background. On the table in front of us, the professor has laid out several tools of his trade. Black wine glasses, sandpaper and furry swatches, and something I completely misidentify. Is that an ashtray? <laughs> it's the world's first gastrophysics plate. <laughs> ashtray, indeed. <laughs> he uses this kit to show the various ways we can be swayed by different sensory cues. Maybe of all those bottles you were looking at, which one's captured your attention? Some people we see using the recent emergence of blue wine, blue sparkling wine, blue uh, still white wine in Italy, in France, in Spain. That doesn't really have a flavour purpose but it will stand out on the shelf. Sorry, can I just stop you for just one second? Blue wine? Yeah. So there is a a Spanish brand. They uh, have blue-white wine. They say it's all for the millennials, and it's not just about the taste, but it's about how it looks. Certainly having a blue glass of wine is going to be more likely that people will want to Instagram it. Hey, look what I'm looking at. It's cool, it's trendy, it's different. Experimenting with blue wine is not likely to make the best impression in every culture. China is really big. There's still a lot of people who just don't understand what wine is. Tassina Sher is a wine consultant in China. Especially because in Chinese, if we talk about wine, they actually, in Chinese, it's translated as great wine rather than red wine or white wine. So a lot of Chinese people, they think that wine is only red. There's no white wine. Tassina had a career in marketing in Hong Kong and then decided to take some time out to live in the UK, where she learned to be a winemaker. She decided to bring her knowledge back to China, a good opportunity in a country predicted to be the second largest wine market in the world sometime in the next decade, but one with some very specific barriers to overcome. 
Uh, usually, the front label is kind of from the winery, but then in China, as a compulsory, that you need to have a back label translated into Chinese, and that will have like you know the grape variety, the vintage, alcohol level, and everything like that. So the back label must be in Chinese. Before, actually, a long time ago, they don't have it now. Maybe twenty years ago, or so the compulsory, they must have expiry date as well. So this is a little bit appalling because wine doesn't really have an expiry date. But then at that time, Chinese law say they must have let's say ten years expiry. So imagine that you. Got a bottle of wine which is 1990, let's say, and in 2000 you think it's expired already, you cannot drink it. Fortunately, now you know the expired term is not there anymore. It's strange to think of wine as a perishable product, like the grapes which make it. However, no less intriguing is the idea of matching what you taste to what you hear. The research shows that when you change the music playing in the wine store or in the wine aisle of the supermarket. That has a dramatic effect on social drinkers' choice of wine and how much they're willing to pay. So, if it's classical music, you'll spend more on the wine than you would if it's just top forty hits. Experimental psychologist Charles Spence again. Quite often, if I'm doing a multi-sensory experiential tasting with people, as I was doing last week in the Netherlands, two hundred and fifty people, everyone had a glass of white and red wine in front of them, and the idea is to listen to the two pieces of music and then raise the glass that matches the music you're listening to. And what you see is that most people, when they hear their flute concerto or the clarinet, up goes their white wine glass. And people can just look around the room and see, well, not everybody, but ninety some percent of people are all lifting the white wine glass. Whereas the red wine goes up into the air with the Camina Barana, to go with sort of the heavy red wine. And I think that then raises an interesting point: Why did you all do that? And why are you all doing the same thing? Because wine doesn't literally have a sound. And yet we all felt some kind of natural affinity between what we're listening to and what we were tasting, and that sort of leads into our work on sonic seasoning and accentuating the wine tasting experience through music. But sometimes music is just music. There in the background to add atmosphere. How are you? How are you? How are you? Like at this candlelit restaurant in South London. Where Joe Black and Will Clement are hosting a Christmas wine tasting. Okay, everybody, um, just to say a big warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. The theme tonight is posh versus plonk. Posh being the more expensive wines, plonk being the cheaper ones, and we like to get people to taste them side by side, decide which one they prefer before we tell them anything about which one is which. And in past experience, have people been able to tell the difference? Yeah, totally. I mean, that is one of the most surprising things. I think that people think that they don't know anything about wine tasting, and you just give them these tools to go. What does it smell like? What's the kind of complexity in this thing? And most of the time, people can absolutely tell. Well, that's really interesting because most of the people I talk to say that in blind tastings, people can't tell the difference. I think blind tasting is a silly game. You know, it's something where people guess. Is it this grape variety? Is it that grape variety? That's not really what we're doing. We're talking about quality. So actually, if you put two wines together, where one is simply better than the other, people go, "Well, that's just more delicious." At this event, for thirty-five pounds, guests get a welcome cocktail, and because it's Christmas, a glass of champagne as well. The twenty participants will try two sets of white wines and two sets of red, with a break in the middle for some dinner. There are booklets on the table to help identify colours and flavours, and Joe and Will help out with a bit of instruction. How long do the flavours last?、Uh, can you still taste them thirty seconds, a minute after you've had a sip? Knowing whether it's posh and plonk doesn't really have a bearing on which one people prefer. What's really interesting at our tastings when we do this kind of thing, they'll go, "Okay, I know which one's posh and which one's plonk, and I actually prefer the cheaper wine."、Mm-hmm. And it's good to know. That that's the sort of thing that I like to drink. It looks like people don't really trust into their own feelings, specifically when it comes to wine. Hilke Plasman is INSEAD Chair Professor of Decision Neuroscience at the INSEAD Business School in France. She specialises in research into what influences consumer behaviour. I think more generally, we have low confidence in our sense of taste and smell. I do find this across the board, even when people are judging water, for example. One of the main markers we use to judge the quality of any product is its price. This is especially true for something as varied and variable as wine. Professor Plasman tested this theory 
on over 500 wine-drinking participants to examine how strongly our opinions are shaped by what we think something costs. They came to my lab and they would be lying inside an fMRI scanner and there would be several tubes from the control room going inside the scanner and they would then kind of turn into one straw. That's, I guess, a good way of imagining this. The subjects thought they were tasting five different wines. In fact, two were actually identical. Two of the wines were offered to them at two different price levels. One's a high price level, for example, $90, which was a real retail price, or $10, which was not the real retail price. And then when I asked the participants a question, could you taste differences between the wines? They said, yes, they could. Right? So they did not understand that these were the same wines. This phenomenon is called the marketing placebo effect. The price tag affects that region in your brain that encodes your liking of the taste. So in other words, you do not only think that you like the more expensive wine more, you feel you like the more expensive wine more because your brain region that encodes this feeling is influenced by the price tag. Do you think you know which one's posh and which one's plump? No, we're embarrassingly confused. But we're enjoying the drinking aspect of it. Being able to, they sort of give you some guidance at the start and then you kind of discuss it in a group. And it's quite nice because you've been given these labels and then you're trying to assign them blind to to two things in front of you. It's all quite laid back so you don't feel under any pressure. I'm quite prepared to be wrong. Yeah, I think we definitely will be wrong. But it's all a bit fun. Uh, Let's reveal which is which. One number one is um, by our standards this evening. The Blanc um, wine, we call that Poche and Blanc for austerity. And, um, and that round, the Blanc has it. So it doesn't have to be Poche to be the preferred option. I got it wrong in the first round. I guess there's something good about the blind test is that you don't know going into it and you're having to just rely on your own taste. And then now there's another round coming. You know that you got the first round wrong, so now I think I'm probably going to think more carefully and taste more carefully and try to apply what they've said, which I suppose is kind of what they're aiming for. Do you think that it will become easier to tell the difference as the night goes on? Well, as long as we don't get too drunk, yeah, hopefully. You're listening to The Why Factor on the BBC World Service. I'm Sandra Canthal. The programme editor is Andrew Smith. And it's been mixed by Tom Brignall. If you like this edition, please go back through our past series to find other episodes you may enjoy. Like Why We Run Restaurants or Why We Eat Chilies. You can find them by going to bbc.com slash whyfactor. Whether you want to go all out and lick rocks to train your palate or are just happy when someone fills your glass, if you're celebrating this holiday season with a glass of wine, enjoy and rest assured, your taste is good taste. Wine is fun. You know, it's just about pleasure at the end of the day. Working for a wine importer, I spend my days putting numbers into spreadsheets and working out efficiencies and that sort of thing. So it is an absolute pleasure to come along taste wine with people and just watch people getting happy because people do it, wine does make people happy you know, and that's really lovely to see and we love that